introduce Vince Cogliano, the Deputy Director for Scientific Programs of the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or OEHA. Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome the panel and the audience to this meeting of the Scientific Guidance Panel for the California Environmental Contaminant Biomonitoring Program, also known as Biomonitoring California. Thank you all for participating and for sharing your expertise. First, I'd like to introduce you to OEHA's new Chief Deputy Director, Dave Edwards. Prior to joining OEHA, Dave was Assistant Chief of the Air Quality Planning and Science Division at the California Air Resources Board. He started at Cal EPA as an environmental scientist at the State Water Board. Dave holds a PhD and master's degree in chemistry from Princeton and brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the position. Welcome, Dave. The scientific guidance panel last met on July 16th, 2021. The meeting started with an update on program activities and planning for AB 67, 617 biomonitoring study, which will examine the effectiveness of school air filtration on reducing children's air pollution exposures. The remainder of the meeting is focused on using biomarkers of effect in air pollution biomonitoring informed by guest presentations on first, a study of Fresno traffic related air pollution and biomarkers of effect in children. And second, challenges in conducting air filtration intervention studies, including study design issues. Panel members, guest speakers, and the audience participated in an open discussion section about um, air pollution biomarkers of effect to delve further into study design considerations aspects of measurement and results interpretation. Discussion topics included optimal timing for urine sample collection, recommendations for exposure questionnaire content, such as cooking practices and consumption of barbecued, grilled, or fried food, time spent outdoors, and mask wearing. Designing a reminder, such as a refrigerator magnet for parents about study activities, and possible options for including the control group. A summary of input for the July meeting and complete transcript will be posted on the July Scientific Guidance Panel meeting page at biomonitoring.ca.gov. Because we're meeting virtually today, I would like to have the Scientific Guidance Panel members introduce themselves. I'll call them on each member alphabetically by last name. First up is Carl Craner. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Carl Craner, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Riverside, and member, a faculty member of Environmental Toxicology on the same campus. Thank you. Ulrike Luderer. Good morning, Ulrike Luderer, Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health in the Program in Public Health at the University of California, Irvine. Thank you. Tom McCone. Uh, good morning. I'm Tom McCown. I'm Professor Emeritus of Environmental Health Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. Thank you. Jenny Quintana. Hi, I'm Penelope or Jenny Quintana. I'm a professor of environmental health at the School of Public Health at San Diego State University. Thank you. Vina Singla. Good morning, Vina Singla. I'm a senior scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Healthy People and Thriving Communities Program. Thank you. I should announce that this will be Vina Singla's last meeting as a scientific guidance all right, panel. I'm then. sorry, Vince. I need to chime in real quickly. Um, Elizabeth Jose Suarez is actually attending and he doesn't have a link. Could you send him a panelist link right now? I will send him a link immediately. Thank you so much. I'm going to text him um, back to you, Vince, and when he's on, you can introduce Jose as well. He, if okay, he's I'll also, sir, if he has joined, I can promote him. I didn't see him. No, he said he doesn't have a link. He can't find a link. So I just want to make sure we sent the link. Um, Sending one right now. Thank you. Okay, I'll be watching for his name to pop up. But, okay, anyway, I was I'd like to announce that this is going to be Vina Singler's last meeting as a scientific guidance panel member. Vina was appointed by the Senate Rules Committee in 2018, and prior to that provided input at SGP meetings as a program stakeholder. She has decided not to seek reappointment to give more attention to her many other commitments, 
which include work as a senior scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council, serving on the US EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, the National Toxicology Program's Board of Scientific Counselors, and the Board for the Clean Air for Clean Production Action. She did not come to this decision lightly, but is confident that she's leaving behind both a strong program and a supportive and involved SGP. We would all like to thank her for her outstanding service to the people of California and wish her the best, the very best in future endeavors. And now I think I will turn the uh, microphone over to Meg Schwarzman, the chair of the SGP, who will provide more details about today's meeting. Thank you. I'm Dr. Meg Schwarzman, um, a physician and- um, I'm sorry, Meg, can you just hold, for some yeah. reason, um, although we have these invitations, Jose didn't get his and Oliver didn't get his. So can you just hold- Should we for, just wait? Yeah, let's okay. just hold for a minute. Um, Elizabeth, if you could follow up. We have it listed that we sent it out, so you might want, might be able to just- I, I, have sent, I have sent Jose's, if either wants to use the public link, I can promote them instantaneously on the website. Okay, uh, does Oliver have his? Oliver have his. I thought that that was sent out, um, so you should just be able to forward it. Yes. And this is Jose Suarez. Good morning, everybody, and I'm in now. Thank you so much, Jose, and sorry about that uh, slight glitch. Thank you. Hello. Now I'm in. Sorry Thank for that. Thank you so much, Oliver. Oliver. Sorry for that slight glitch. Okay, everybody is on. Welcome. Over to you, Meg. I guess uh, we should return back and have um, Jose and Oliver introduce themselves. Oliver Fien, UC Davis, um, mass spectrometry and analysis of chemicals. Thank you, Jose. I'm Jose Suarez, uh, Associate Professor in the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health at UC San Diego. Thank you. And I'm Meg Schwarzman. I'm faculty at UC Berkeley School of Public Health, Environmental Health Sciences Division. Um, and with that, thank you for getting everybody in who needed to be in and um, introduced. And we'll start um, the rest of the meeting. I want to give an overview of the meeting by starting with the panel goals for today. Um, we will, as usual, first receive a program update um, with the remainder of the meeting focusing on discussion of perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which we refer to collectively as PFASs. State staff will discuss California's activities on PFAS, including PFAS biomonitoring in surveillance studies and community-focused studies and Cal EPA's efforts to address these compounds also. We'll have guest speakers from Obrero University in Sweden, Boston University School of Public Health and uh, Duke University. And they will prevent, present, excuse me, on uh, PFAS laboratory methods and also sources of human exposure. After the presentations, we will hold an open discussion with guest speakers um, and the audience. And that will be to address questions on how Biomonitoring California can support efforts to reduce exposure to PFAS, including possible next step uh, for the program. After each presentation, as we usually do, there will be a time for questions from panel members and from the audience. So let me take just a moment to explain how we do these comment periods um, and discussions on the remote, in the remote format. So during the question periods that come after each talk, uh, speakers, please remain unmuted with your webcam showing so that you can respond to questions. If SGP members wanna speak or ask a question, just raise your hand, you'll have your webcam on and I can see you. Um, and then you'll unmute yourself after I call on you um, and comment or ask a question. If webinar attendees have questions or comments, please submit them via either the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar or by email to biomonitoring at oehha.ca.gov. 
And please just keep your comments um, focused on the items under discussion and, and brief will read aloud any relevant comments, um, paraphrasing them if they're uh, long. During both the morning and afternoon public comment periods and in the afternoon discussion session, webinar attendees can also speak. If you don't wanna submit a written uh, comment, you can speak. Uh, then please use the raise hand feature in Zoom and I'll call on you. So with that, I wanna introduce our first speaker. Narissa Wu is the overall lead for Biomonitoring California and chief of the exposure assessment section in the Environmental Health Investigations Branch or EHIB at California Department of Public Health. She'll provide an update on current program activities. All right. Um, can you hear me? Wait, I'm going to get my screen. And do you now see my slides? Everything appear okay? We do. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us, especially those of you who are calling in from different time zones. Um, I just want to start by adding my thanks to Zena as well for your participation on the scientific guidance panel and just your ongoing support for the program. We'll miss having you on the panel. So I only have you for 10 minutes today, so I'm going to be brief. I'm covering some administrative updates um, where we are as a program, and then I will turn to updates on two of our projects. So last time we met, we had just gotten news of our newly signed budget, which includes an additional $2 million annually from general fund. This is super welcome news for the program. So we are going through all the administrative tasks to make sure the budget, um, the funding gets to the right place and is used to support the program in the key areas we've been highlighting over the years. Um, we've talked about the need for sustainable funding to help maintain lab staff and to keep our expertise that the labs have developed. And on the EPI side, we um, need to be able to analyze and release data more quickly. We've talked about the need to support field work and to be able to reestablish our surveillance efforts. So towards those goals, um, we are recruiting for a number of different positions, um, epidemiologists at the research scientists one, three, and four levels. Um, we're looking for health program specialists and we have laboratorians, chemists um, for the lab posted. Um, all of these positions are available on Cal Careers. Um, they're also, for the EHIP positions, they're also listed on our EHIP website. And I think there will be a notice going out to our listserv as well through the biomonitoring membership. Um, so please pass this information along to anyone who might be interested in joining our team, or if you yourself are interested in coming to be part of Biomonitoring California. We do have a workshop planned for November 22nd to talk to people about what it's like to work in the public sector and particularly for biomonitoring California and how to go about applying for jobs in the California state sector, um, state system. So I'm happy to share um, links and registration information on that um, after my talk. Um, bringing in staff into the state system is a long, slow process, um, but we hope to have some progress to report back to you at our next meeting. Um, we do have two new staff people to introduce to you. We have Faye Andrews, our new epidemiologist, also a new doctor um, at EHIB, um, and Cheryl Holtzmeyer, who has recently joined OEHA as a health program specialist, and she's helping to run this meeting. They're both making contributions already. Welcome to the two of you. Um, and I also wanted to mention that this is Jeb Waldman's last meeting as a part of Biomonitoring California, although he's welcome to join as a member of the general public next year. Um, Jed is retiring at the end of this year, and um, our program won't be quite the same without him. So thank you to Jed for everything you've done for the program as well. So on to project updates. Um, the Stockton Air Pollution Exposure Project, or SAPEP, we've made a lot of progress in the last, um, the last month, finalizing study tools on um, things like consent forms, questionnaires, recruitment materials, They've gotten their full approval from the IRB um, and have confirmed a school site, the All Saints Academy of Stockton, which is a small school of about 90 kindergarten to eighth graders and with a very supportive principal. So they've done a site visit and they are actually starting recruitment this week. Um, field work is scheduled um, to begin in early December. You remember this project that involves two sample collection points one week apart and we'll have a much more thorough update at the March SGP meeting. 
We also have some progress to um, report for the California Regional Exposure or CARE study. We had just returned results for our participants the last time we met, um, and we should have our summary results posted to the web in the next few weeks. Um, noting that while we recruited participants following the same care protocol as our first two regions, um, the early closure of CARE 3 means that we only had 90 participants, and so there are limits to how we can interpret that data. We're also working on this CARE report, which will include detailed study methods and results. Um, and I want to say just a word about the choice to do a report, because this is something a little bit new for the program. Um, the report gives us an opportunity to talk about the study in the context of our larger program and to also get really into the details of the method and choices we made as part of the study design. And I think that will help the reader understand what the data represents and how it can be used and interpreted. Um, the report will have both unweighted and weighted data, and which will provide better exposure estimates for the region. And that will be a better comparison both for us, but also for other researchers to use when we have comparative data. We'll also have data by demographic strata, which will be very useful. So releasing a report like this does not mean we won't be publishing in scientific journals as well. As we delve more into statistical analyses, um, there will be other opportunities for us to publish via that route. Um, in any case, we hope to be finishing up this report in the next month or so and releasing it in early 2022. Five minutes already, oh goodness. Um, as we work on the CARE report, it's also an opportunity for us to learn from our previous experiences and think about our next steps in conducting surveillance. So we're continuing to meet with other collaborators and defining program priorities. And we're also taking input from different stakeholders and recommendations from experts like this panel into consideration. Um, so these are the recommendations that we provided in our last meeting after that discussion. So thanks to Meg and Jenny for summarizing these for inclusion in the seventh report to the legislature. Um, one of the prioritizations we always have to keep in mind is which chemical panels should we be focusing on? Um, and this is not just an issue for the lab with respect to what methods they should be prioritizing, but our focus also has bearing on the design of a study, where we might cite a study, whom we want to include in a study, and what questions to include in a questionnaire. So the topic for today's discussion is a chemical class that has been a priority for this program, as well as for state and nationwide concern. And likely it does not need any introduction for this audience, um, but in case you are joining us for the first time or new to biomonitoring, these are the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, the PFASs. Um, there are, are several different definitions in play. Um, the definition presented here is from Bucks et al., and it's a definition that this program uses for the purposes of designation. Tom Webster will talk a little bit more about the different definitions and the implications thereof in his afternoon session. But again, for our program, the definition is relevant because of what the designated list means in terms of what we are enabled to measure as a program. PFASs are primarily used to make products resistant to stains, water, and grease. And many of the products we use in our everyday lives, things like stain-resistant carpets or stain-resistant furniture, take out containers that we want to hold soupy or greasy foods are often treated with PFASs. They're used in industry, added to metal plating and finishing processes to reduce toxic air emissions. And of course, they are part of the AFFF fire suppressant foam used to fight fires. Manufacturing of the longer chain PFASs has been outfaced out of the US, many of those, um, but thousands of PFASs are, um, continue to be used and manufactured worldwide. And why do we care? Why are we concerned about PFASs? Well, different PFASs have been found to be associated with a wide range of health impacts, including thyroid disease and some cancers, increased cholesterol, infertility and adverse birth outcomes, altered child development, impacts on liver enzyme activity, and a weakened immune system. As I said, many have been phased out. But as some of the legacy PFASs are persistent and bioaccumulative, we're still finding them in our bodies. And as shorter chain PFASs are still widely used, um, as we have seen for many chemicals, there is this opportunity for regrettable substitutions. As we move away from one set of PFASs, we introduce the use of another. Um, this trend in use over time, the decreases in some PFASs and increases in others, is the kind of scenario for which biomonitoring can be very useful to monitor how our body burdens follow our manufacturing trends. 
So during the day, you'll hear about different lab methods. Um, currently, our lab has several methods available for looking at PFASs, including the method to measure the 12 legacy PFASs. There's the expanded 40 PFAS replacement, um, um, 40 PFAS um, panel, which includes some of the um, replacement PFASs. And then there is the non-targeted analysis for PFASs and other chemicals of concern. So these are currently available in serum. The lab is working to further automate and make these more sensitive, faster, and greener, um, and also validate the methods in plasma. So without overview, I want to conclude my portion of the talk and turn things over to our PFAS experts, but I will be open to questions after our next couple of speakers. Thank you so much, um, Nerissa. Yeah, and just to repeat that, that we'll have a question session once we've heard from some of the other uh, staff scientists about PFAS. So I want to introduce Carl Palmer, our next speaker. Carl's Deputy Director for the Safer Consumer Products Program in the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and he will provide an overview of Cal EPA activities on PFAS. Thank you, Meg. I'm just going to share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, Meg. Um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, Vina for your service on the SGP. We'll look forward to engaging with you and your other endeavors and capacities. So thank you very much. Uh, and thanks, Narissa, for the good summary. Um, I'm going to move ahead here, I think. There we go. Uh, my disclosure is I have no financial conflicts of interest. And I'm the deputy director of the Safer Consumer Products at uh, DTSC of Cal EPA. So as you're probably familiar, at the highest level, Cal EPA's mission is to really restore, protect, and enhance the environment and to ensure public health, environmental quality, and economic vitality. We do this by developing and implementing and enforcing environmental laws that regulate air, water, soil quality, pesticide use, hazardous and solid waste, recycling and reduction, and the development of safer consumer products. I always like to say that chemicals don't adhere to the laws of man, but the laws of nature. So while we tend to regulate chemicals within these frameworks and silos of bureaucracies, uh, they don't pay much attention, they do what they do which creates challenges for all of us. Um, our collaborative effort at Cal EPA uh, is manifested in one way in establishing this PFAS working group. And we've invited our partners at the Department of Public Health to join us as well. And the role of our work group is really to share information about what we're all doing so that we can learn, coordinate and collaborate uh, and move forward in our mission. So I'm gonna start with what's going on at the water board. They're doing a lot of things, so bear with me. Uh, the state water board statewide PFAS investigations have targeted airports and bulk fuel term terminals and refineries because they use aqueous film foaming uh, flame retardants. Uh, they use, and they look at chrome plating facilities. The water board looks at chrome plating facilities because of their use of mist suppressants, which contain PFASs. And they are looking at municipal solid waste landfills and wastewater treatment plants because they receive waste that contains PFAS. In coordination with the issuance of orders to the public water systems, they asked to sample their wells uh, adjacent to airports and landfills and those wells with PFAS detections from EPA's uh, third unregulated contaminant monitoring rule sampling events and in the vicinity of those wells. Since the issuance of those, <clears throat> excuse me, initial screening sampling events, additional orders have been issued to public water systems to expand outward from the previous detections and in the vicinity of DOD sites. Future sampling will be performed as data comes in and they determine the extent of source areas and additional uh, sampling needs. To give you some um, look at what they've done, the primary investigatory objectives of the statewide orders are to gather information on the occurrence of PFAS in California's drinking water sources and watersheds. Data will be evaluated to identify impacted drinking water wells, and identify areas where additional work is needed to ensure that communities reliant on those drinking water wells are provided safe drinking water and where additional public water supply well sampling would be appropriate. The data will also be used to inform additional areas where watershed specific source identification efforts are needed and to inform future investigation requirements. Finally, 
The data collected will also continue to inform the consideration of public health goals developed by OEHA and eventually lead to the maximum contaminant levels adopted by the state water boards. To give you some idea of what the data has shown since 2019, the re results of the sampling at the public water systems are indicating that only 13% of those wells have an exceedance of the response level. The response levels for PFOA is 10 nanograms per liter and for PFOS, PFOS is 40 nanograms per liter. And if there's an exceedance of the response level, the public water system must either take the well offline, treat the well, usually through blending, or notify the public. The Division of Drinking Water will continue to require public water systems to sample for PFAS in wells outward of any of these ex exceedances. Additionally, sampling for PFAS will continue in these wells until further notice by the Drinking Water Division. This next slide is a little complicated, but, but essentially what it does is it reports on the results from the public water systems. Those are the, the bars in orange and the results from airports and landfill investigations, which are the bars in gray. And you can see the percentage of PFAS is detected in those, in those efforts. There were two different methods used for uh, these events. And so you can see that the data from the investigations that the airports and landfills show many more compounds, specifically the shorter change PF, PFAAs that are being detected at high frequency. Because of these, results, the Division of Drinking Water is considering shifting from the EPA method used, um, which you see in the orange bars, to the uh, DOD developed method, which uh, shows a, a greater, um, broader array of analytes captured, and particularly the shorter chain PFAAs. Now, the importance of the, the, the information is because the Water Board is tasked with the developing uh, MCLs for drinking water standards. And so this is a multi-stage part um, process. Uh, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment is a key uh, part of this process. And you can see here that for notification levels have been established for PFOA and PFOS, and there's recommendations for the public health goals for both those compounds. There's uh, for PFBS, there's a, a notification level uh, proposed. And the hope is that for PFOA and PFOS that we'll have MCLs in place in 2025. So also it's important to note that the Water Board has requested additional um, work by OEA to look at five uh, additional compounds. This is a pretty busy slide, but it has a lot of uh, links to really good information. The Water Board is acting for Cal EPA to kind of collect a lot of the information that the different boards and offices and agencies are collecting. And they have some really good um, information there. I encourage everyone to look at that. Moving on, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what OEA is doing, and, and there are many people in this meeting who know better than I, but um, OEA's mission really is to protect and enhance the health of Californians and the state's environment through scientific evaluations that inform, support, and guide regulatory and other actions. They're the lead state agency for conducting health risks, risk, risk for evaluating health risks posed by environmental contaminants. They also uh, implement Prop 65 and um, so you can see here that um, OHIA has completed notification levels for PFOA and PFOS. I'm not going to go into the details. You can read those there, and as well as for PFBS. And then there are proposed health goals for PFOA and PFOS um, that are also established. These are important part of establishing the, the drinking water standards, and um, they are working closely with the Water Board in that process. Um, note that the notification levels are health-based advisory levels, they're not regulatory, um, and that OEA conducts risk assessment of a chemical and provides the recommendations to the Water Board, who then sets the notification levels. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, the Water Board has requested that notification levels be set or be provided from OEA uh, in the journey towards health-based drinking water standards for these additional six um, PFASs. Now note, well, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, also, I wanna just mention that um, in the responsibilities to implement Prop 65, um, OEA listed PFOA and PFOS um, on Prop 65 for reprodu as reproductive toxicants. And then in March of, of this year, 
um, issued a notice of intent, intent to list PFOA as a carcinogen. Additionally, there's two important meetings coming up in December. One of the Carcinogen Identification Committee that will be considering listing PFOS as a carcinogen. And in December 14th, there'll be a meeting of the Developmental and Reproductive Toxicant Identification Committee to consider PFNA and its salts and PFDA and its salts as reproductive toxicants. Moving on to our colleagues at the Air Resources Board. Um, they're in the process of updating their airborne toxic control measures. And what their focus is right now is looking at PFASs that are used as chemical fume suppressants in plating baths. And this is uh, at, particularly at chrome plating facilities. Um, they've also uh, funded research by UC Berkeley looking at environmental um, uh, assessment methods to collect and analyze PFAS in air, dust, and soil. And this is a general challenge across the agency is, and I know you're gonna be talking more about this later, is how do you assess um, where PFAS is in the environment uh, and the potential exposures that ultimately end up in people and in other media. Moving on to CalRecycle. Um, CalRecycle's primary mission is to promote the reduction of solid waste and to promote recycling as well as composting. And they're working with UC Davis to look at composting and what happens to PFAS in that environment. And uh, so there's a lot of interesting work going on there. They also this year uh, adopted regulations pursuant to the sustainable packaging for this uh, act that was passed in 2018. That act required that CalRecycle put forth regulations that that require food service facilities uh, used on state properties to use re reusable, recyclable, and compostable food packaging. And they've done that. And interestingly, they put in there some provisions that address PFAS and, and limit PFAS in those uh, products. And you'll note that, again, it's, it's important for us to be able to, how, to assess uh, where PFAS is, not only in the environment, but also in the products that we use. Uh, and what methods we use to do that. So they've been working on that. Our colleagues at the Department of Pesticide Regulation uh, found out earlier this year that while um, they did an initial search to look at all of the registered pesticides to see if PFASs were used, and they didn't find that any PFASs were used in the, the pesticides themselves. However, they did come into information that some containers contain PFAS and that those containers um, had certain PFASs that had leached into the product. And so they've been working with those manufacturers and with US EPA to change out and use non-fluorinated containers uh, for pesticides. Um, the area for which I'm most familiar with and responsible for is at DTSC. And I wanted to note that at DTSC, we have three core programs. We have our cleanup program, our hazardous waste program, and the Safer Consumer Products program. In the cleanups program, uh, much like the water board's challenges, we're looking at dealing with PFAS in groundwater and remediating um, PFAS in groundwater to particularly protect drinking water wells. Um, in our hazardous waste program, we're considering looking at whether we should regulate PFAS containing waste as hazardous waste in California. Note that others have petitioned US EPA to make hazardous waste out of, excuse me, to include PFAS waste as hazardous waste under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And then my program, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, but I also wanted to also note that our environmental chemistry lab, which part is a partner in the Biomonitoring California program, uh, helps us in our program and our other programs to both evaluate um, different media that contain PFAS as well as consumer products that contain PFAS. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my program because I know it best and because I think it's also relevant. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the SGP for listing PFAS as a class on your priority chemicals list in 2015. That opened the door for us to look at these chemicals in consumer products because our regulations require that we look at 23 other authoritative body lists, one of which is the SGP priority list um, for chemicals that are on our menu that we can consider when we regulate these chemicals and products. Um, it's important to note that um, we are viewing this as a class approach because one of our missions is to uh, ensure that we don't move from one hazardous or problematic chemical to another one uh, in the chemical whack-a-mole process that um, we've 
experience, all experience. And so by treating PFAS as a class, we can, through our regulations, ensure that when we ask people to look at a safer alternative to that PFAS, they don't just sh sh move from one PFAS to another PFAS, but they have to consider the entire class and look for alternatives outside that class, uh, which is um, a very efficient way to, to regulate when you've got thousands of, of chemicals that you might be uh, considering in that class. So uh, we published a, a paper on this in Environmental Health, health Perspectives, uh, um, documenting our approach, uh, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without the SGP. Uh, what that looked like in practice then is uh, earlier this year, we adopted as a priority product in our rulemaking framework, carpets and rugs that contain PFAS. And what that meant, meant is that uh, anyone who sells a carpet or a rug into California that contains PFAS is now subject to our safer consumer product regulations. They're required to notice, that, notice us if they're selling those products and then go through a robust alternatives assessment process to hopefully find a safer alternative. Um, we're going to be uh, we're in the process right now of adopting regulations that will capture treatment products, things like Scotchgard and other treatments that are sprayed onto textiles and leathers. Um, and then we're, we uh, will be looking potentially at children's products and cosmetics that contain PFAS as well. I note that PFAS food packaging uh, is something we spent a lot of time looking at PFAS on. We had several workshops. We put together a technical document. And I'm going to talk briefly about what the outcome of that was in, in that um, California legislature looked at, at that work we did on food packaging and um, passed a, a law, AB 1200, which banned plant fiber-based food packaging with PFAS starting in 2023. It had some other aspects of it as well. The important thing there is it was uh, looking at PFAS as a class, using the good work that, that we did um, to support that action to accelerate regulation of those products. Uh, other bills that were passed, which were also related to PFAS, uh, Friedman Bill AB 652 was for a, a variety of juvenile products banning PFAS in their use. And then note that uh, AFFF foams containing PFAS uh, were also um, restricting from sale via SB 1044, effective this coming January. And I also note that many other states across the country, from Maine to Washington to New Mexico, are passing uh, states related to. PFAS and a variety of consumer products because of concerns of potential exposure and harm. Lastly, I'll just uh, wrap up by saying that um, in uh, last month, uh, the US EPA uh, put out their uh, strategic roadmap for PFAS. Um, it's an ambitious look at how uh, they can use a variety of authorities under US EPA's um, <clears throat> umbrella to look at PFAS throughout its life cycle in all media over time. Um, and this is, uh, there's a lot of depth to this. I encourage people to look at it. Um, and it's very ambitious, um, but we certainly need to move forward it, it, with this class on so many different fronts. And hopefully what you see in my brief overview um, of what's going on at Cal EPA, that PFAS touches each one of our departments. It doesn't pay attention to uh, our political or uh, regulatory bureaucratic barriers, um, and there's a lot of work to do. So with that, that summarizes just a brief look at what we're doing uh, at Cal EPA. Uh, this is my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Again, we'll have um, time for questions after um, our panelist or presenter right now, who's uh, Catherine Kathleen Atfield. She's chief of the Biomonitoring Investigations and Outreach Unit, which is part of the Exposure Assessment Section in EHIB at the California Department of Public Health, DPH. Kathleen will discuss Biomonitoring California's findings on PFAS from the CARE study and some earlier work. Good morning. Can you hear me properly? Yep, that's good. Wonderful. And you can see my slides. Okay. So good morning. Again, my name is Kathleen Atfield. I'm with the California Department of Public Health and our Biomonitoring California program. And I want to provide some updates on our activities as related to PFAS. Kathleen, I'm not seeing your slides, but that might be a problem with mine, not with others. No, you're not no. seeing your slides. 
They're not available. Okay, excuse me, sorry. Perfect. Okay. So before I launch into my talk, I'd like to uh, quickly revisit that our studies of PFAS are situated within the Biomonitoring California's mandate to determine biological levels of environmental chemicals in Californians, to establish trends in these levels of chemicals in uh, Californians' bodies over time, to help to assess the effectiveness of public health efforts and regulatory programs to decrease exposures to specific chemicals. Biomonitoring California's general approach to understanding pollutant biomarker trends has been to conduct uh, surveillance activities and look for indicators of concern where we may then uh, characterize specific populations using community-based approaches. And these might be in specific geographic areas, in specific racial or ethnic communities or occupational groups, or in sensitive subpopulations, such as with pregnant women. In today's talk, I will visit uh, some of the different populations we have assessed with PFAS within and dive into demographic trends uh, we have observed, including ethnic and racial disparities. And since the program has conducted a number of studies to date with a lot of valuable information waiting to be explored, I will end with a discussion of opportunities for further data analyses and asking for the panel's suggestions for prioritizing these in terms of their best impact on public health and regulatory efforts and learning more on exposure sources. So here's a list of the biomonitoring California studies that have measured PFASs uh, from 2010 to 2020. In most of our studies, we've been measuring the 12 common legacy PFAS, uh, but we have a couple studies where we have measured up to 30 PFAS. So the ones I'm going to spend the most time today in speaking with uh, speaking about are the CARE regional exposure studies, the California regional exposure studies, uh, primarily on our first two regions in LA and CARE 2, uh, eastern and southeastern counties. Uh, I will also talk about opportunities that we have with the ACE studies of Asian Americans in the San Francisco, San Jose area, the MAMA studies of pregnant women, and are uh, back, hearkening back to our very first population-based study uh, with Kaiser members uh, that is called the BEST study. So from uh, these various studies in the past, uh, we, are we have been learning as, uh, from these in order to look at our data from our care studies. And we have seen a number of trends from these prior studies including very high detection frequencies uh, of PFNA, PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, where it's over 95% detections in those three studies, and also very frequent detections of, of others. We've seen levels that increase with age, uh, differences by sex and gender, in which males often have higher levels, and also differences by race and ethnicity, where Asian populations tend to have higher levels of many of the PFAS. So for CARE, uh, the California Regional Exposure Studies, uh, we have um, presented periodic updates to this panel. And for these, we have recruited across each region to represent the demographics of that particular area using a quota sampling approach. In CARE LA, we visited um, the entire county of Los Angeles in the spring of 2018 and garnered 430 participants. And our second region, uh, CARE 2, from Mono all the way down to Imperial counties, uh, we um, recruited 359 participants over the spring of 2019. Our participants who completed the studies ended up skewing slightly female, with a median age of 51, and race percentages generally reflected the population of the region. However, to improve our uh, ability to use our central estimates as population estimates and to better enable comparisons across regions, we are currently undergoing a calculation of weights that Marissa alluded to, um, and we'll be using those in the future. 
For the rest of this presentation today, however, I'll be referring to interim analyses performed with unweighted data. So um, among these 12 PFAS that were measured in these two populations, we found PFAS in almost all or uh, all participants in Carolean CARE2, like just one person not having a detect any detections in CARE2. And on average, six or seven of them per participant. So the red box here is um, drawn around the PFAS for which we have detection frequencies over 65%. And that's uh, the threshold we use for uh, diving in deeper to look at particular trends in those analytes. So our first step would be to say, how do these regions differ or are similar to uh, national levels? So in, to compare here with NHANES from the most recent cycle for which there is available data, 2017 to 2018. I first have to make a slight caveat about the methods used here and that NHANES has higher levels of detection than, uh, than our DTSC lab. So to make the comparisons, we do have to recensor the data to the NHANES LOD. Um, and that meant that three PFAS there listed on the bottom, PFDEA, PFUA, methyl PFOSA, uh, then we wouldn't be comparing because they drop below that 65% detection threshold. But for the four remaining, they do seem to be uh, lower than national levels. Give you a moment to eyeball that. Um, we do have to keep in mind, though, that uh, there's still one to two years difference in these comparisons. So, so there still could be a small remaining role for temporal effects. As we know, many of these are declining over time. <clears throat> these two care studies are focused on the general population, so it's not too surprising that our 95 percentiles are uh, way below those of highly impacted communities, such as these in the examples from West Virginia, Alabama, and New Hampshire. Analysis of demographic trends display the known impact of gender and sex with the largest impact seen in PFHXS uh, with 87% higher in males for care LA, 80% in care two. And uh, we actually didn't see a statistical difference for methyl PFOSA and PFDEA, but we do see it in those others. You see the impact of increasing age for all six of these PFAS. Um, and this is by decade of age of participant. And the most substantial effect is seen with PFOS uh, with 20 to 22% increase by decade of age of the participant. I'm sorry, my slides are not advancing. There it goes. Patterns in race and ethnicity followed the general trend of Asian participants having the highest levels, followed by white participants, Hispanic, and Black participants. In these tables, I've ordered the PFAS from left to right to uh, indicate the largest effects on the right-hand side and in darker shades of blue. Here we see that PFDEA has the greatest differences between Asians and all other groups, ranging from 84% there at the bottom compared to white participants in Carol A, up to 144% higher than black participants in Carol A. PFOS was the next largest in differences, up to 132% greater than blacks. And uh, I should note that because of the fewer number of black and Asian participants in CARE2, some comparisons uh, did not reach statistical significance here. So extending to other, com other group comparisons, uh, these are not as great, but still um, we see uh, levels higher in white participants than Black and Hispanics, primarily in PFOA, with the largest difference compared to Black participants for CARE at LA um, with PFHXS. 
Uh, an interesting little side note uh, is that the PFOS precursor, methyl PFOSA, uniquely had a different racial pattern than the others, though often this did not reach statistical significance. Uh, for the one in which it did, levels compared to Hispanic participants in Kerala were significantly different at 38% greater concentrations. From our exposure questionnaire, we had begun to look into the contribution of fish and shellfish consumption to these demographic patterns we're observing. Uh, in these regions, there are not known large local PFAS contamination sites, though similar to many parts of the rest of the country, as Carl just talked us through, PFAS have been measured in some drinking water systems and groundwater. Fish and shellfish contributions have been linked to studies of recent PFAS biomarkers, including in our own best study in California, within NHANES data from 2003 to 2014, and in San Francisco, uh, pregnant women in 2014 to 2016 data. Uh, these are usually most often seen with PFOS, PFNA, PFDEA, PFUDA. So uh, the longer chain uh, PFAS there, the decanoic and the undecanoic versions, the 10 and 11 carbon chains. Uh, these studies also uh, had looked at other dietary contributors, but for uh, what I'm going to talk you through today, we're going to mostly focus on fish and shellfish. So I'll start with CARE2, where we have been able to look across many different exposure variables. PFDEA was the only PFAS positively associated uh, with fish and shellfish after multivariable analyses. Um, just for your information, we had asked about fish and shellfish in two ways, those that you buy in the store and those that may be caught by someone known to the participant. So this is primarily for our metals analyses for looking at uh, local fish versus fish that might be more wide um, sourced from a wider area of the world, um, but also could be useful for PFAS analyses. I've combined them here. Uh, so when bought and caught fish are looked at collectively, eating fish one to three times per week, increased concentrations by 22.4%. And if you look at it in the next uh, exposure uh, category up, over three times per week of each, uh, we reach 60.6% .6 higher levels. Shellfish was knocked out of the final model and uh, attempts to make a combination variable with the two did not increase our explanatory power. So fish consumption seems to have impacted the estimates for differences by race, uh, looking here at the Asian uh, participant breakdown. So uh, the adjusted change um, moved from 73% to 62%. And this may be showing a potential current or histor historic exposure source among this region's population. Now moving on to CARE LA, for this, we've only managed so far to look at single exposure sources in tandem with demographics. And here we still see uh, an association of PFDEA with fish consumption, so up to 43.5% higher in the group eating over three times per week of each of those bought and caught, uh, but less of a modification of the estimates tied to race and ethnicity. However, in PFUDA, the unde undecanoic uh, PFAS, we see a large impact with fish consumption, 181% uh, increase over those eating less than once per week and those that eat uh, over three times per week. And we see a fair decrease in the estimates of the contribution for Asian identification. Uh, the benefits of having a study that looks at multiple panels is that some of the panels uh, do end up being correlated based on exposure source. So we had the opportunity here to look at the blood mercury levels, which are also an indicator of fish and shellfish consumption. And uh, for Carolay, six of these um, 
all six of these had a correlation with um, blood mercury um, and three for care two. And our strongest correlations are with the two that I was just showing you uh, um, previously. So with PFUDA and PFDEA. So marching on uh, with the current work that is happening with CARE data, uh, we do have those 90 people from San Diego and, and Orange County for which we are readying data um, for CARE 3 to be placed on the web repository. As mentioned, we are uh, working on weighting our participant data for better population estimates. And as Narissa detailed, we have a report in progress on CARE-LA and CARE 2 data. We also have a new effort on population-based pharmacokinetic modeling with Matt McLeod out of the University of Stockholm, where his team will be simulating lifetime intakes, <clears throat> excuse me, body burdens and elimination kinetics at the population level. Looking forward to other opportunities with care data, we can follow the work further on fish consumption and um, uh, PFAS uh, relationships to be able to understand where there may be links to intervention efforts. We can extend data analyses to address other exposure sources where we have a suitable information in our survey data to link with the potential for evaluating ongoing policy efforts. We have address information, uh, so we may be able to look into links to drinking water. And as Tom Webster will talk, discuss in his talk, Briefly, we have the opportunity to investigate profiles of PFAS, uh, which some researchers are beginning to use to be able to tease out uh, different relative sources of PFAS. Before moving on to our other studies, I did want to contextualize our work within other um, biomonitoring investigations of PFAS in California. So other, other populations under study are middle-aged women in the California Teachers Study, female firefighters and office workers, pregnant women and children. And as Kate Hoffman will later describe, Orange County residents are being recruited for the multi-site ATSDR uh, PFAS studies. And lastly, uh, firefighters at military sites across the US, including California, will have started having PFAS biomonitoring as part of their physical exams which began this past fiscal year. From these cohorts, recent publications describe descriptive distribution or detection data, such as developing non-targeted suspect screening workflow on blood samples and concentrations in those female firefighters and office workers. Uh, they also address dietary predictors of PFAS and links to the health endpoints of birth outcomes, offspring, and telomere length. Now to revisit some of our prior studies for which we have uh, on some ongoing work, but also many opportunities. And we hope you will help us with thinking about prioritization and uh, collaborations that could expand uh, the reach of our work. Uh, we are currently also working on weighting this, best, uh, this data because it can give us an ability to uh, better describe population estimates. Uh, opportunities here exist with prior analyses on demographics and diet that have not been finalized or published, and potential, of course, to work with other data sources, such as looking at links to drinking water. In the ACE projects, uh, which were with Asian American populations in the San Francisco and San Jose areas, we have seen interesting demographic trends within these. Uh, but we have uh, the wonderful opportunity that we have very detailed dietary questionnaire uh, for these studies that are not as much in the same depth in our other studies. Um, and seen so far some interesting association with organ meat consumption. We also have the potential to learn more about the impacts of California of immigration in California and whether the associations we have seen with birth country and time in the US are truly indicative of transported body burdens. As a targeted study, it can also help inform us um, in, in strategizing around designs for future targeted studies 
uh, because of the strengths and limitations involved, one possibly being the limits due to homogeneity of exposures within a targeted group. Um, we also have uh, the interesting opportunity of the uh, what may be revealed with the PFAS profiles here and how they may be illustrated of different exposure patterns. And lastly, for our work with the MAMA studies, and these were with obtained maternal samples from different areas of California through the Genetic Disease Screening Program. Uh, we have newly finished uh, laboratory data from 2015-2016, thank you labs, uh, that we are readying to uh, place into our web repository. We also have a number of interesting opportunities in that we can um, use weights more cleanly here um, and into the future in order to really examine time trends as we go forward. And then also we received the information from GDSP in an anonymized fashion. Uh, so this would enable us to be able to do uh, non-targeted screening approaches because of um, this not incurring our report back requirements. So with that, uh, uh, the, our, there's my list of references and I'll be interested in our discussion. I want to thank our participants across all of our studies for their time and their willingness to give us their biological samples and our supporting organizations as well as Biomonitoring California staff and our state and federal funding. So with that, I will wrap up. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen, and also to Carl and um, Marissa. So we have our time now for questions for each of these three presenters. Um, just as a reminder, we'll do questions from the panel first, and then we'll have public comment, um, and then we'll have a panel discussion on you know, specifically addressing some of these uh, questions that Kathleen has invited input on. So um, if the presenters could have their cameras back on um, and we'll be able to, maybe if I adjust my view, I'll be able to see our panelists better. There you are. Um, and we have 10 minutes um, now for questions from the panelists on any of these three. Tom. Sorry, I'll get my mute off. And if you hear, I apologize, there's some construction going on nearby, it tends to come in. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the, the presenters. This was uh, really, um, really interesting, just a lot to digest. And I'm actually trying to digest it, but I, I, I do have a question and I think, I mean, it's kind of, directed at Carl, but at all three talks, but at uh, Carl Palmer, who did a really nice job about how this has to be integrated across so many different organizations. And I was sort of looking at numbers and pathways. And one of the things that comes up is, you know, the, the level of communication about health levels. And for example, in, in looking at the effort at AWEA to develop, um, uh, notification levels and, and MCLs uh, for mainly for drinking water. You know, I was wondering, well, uh, when, when we see the later presentations or, or um, um, uh, Kathleen's presentation about where it seems to be coming from in the biomonitoring level, well, it's coming from a lot of food pathways. And so uh, is there some effort to say, you know, you know, we have to, like when we set a drinking water standard, we're gonna to have to realize that that's only gonna control a small part of it. We have to be aware of the either the relationship of water to food, but also, you know, food operates independently. Food comes from all over the place. It's not just a California food source. So, um, so I guess I'm getting at is how do we stand back and look at like the cumulative exposure and really understand that better and then how do we ultimately uh, think of the health effects in terms of biomonitor levels? So we'll know how to give guidance, not we, I mean the state, we'll know how to give guidance about what levels of what biomonitor levels uh, should be require notification or concern. 
Uh, so it's kind of a long-winded question, but I, I guess I'm just focusing uh, more on, on understanding a little bit better on how the exposure uh, pathway analysis and biomonitoring really work together to help us really understand the cumulative different pathways of exposure and then what actions, when action is needed and what actions can be taken. So I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll go first and others can chime in. Thanks, uh, Tom. Good question. Um, I think part of, I look at this as there's different buckets of issues here. One, as I kind of highlighted, each of the agencies has our own perspective that's, that's provided to us by our, our authority and our mandates and our resources. Um, and so we do the best we can to collect information from others who are looking at things that intersect in the real world. Uh, but it's very challenging because we don't have the science for cumulative impacts really well defined. It's not in the regulatory um, language, uh, let alone practice like risk assessment has been over the years. Um, and so I would say in, in, at the big buckets, what we need is we need to have good upfront information about where we can find these chemicals. So that's a huge uh, benefit from biomonitoring, but we need it over time so that we can see that when we do take action, that we can measure our success, hopefully, or, or at least gauge it. And that's so it, we need to be in it for the long run. And we also need to keep looking under different lampposts, if you will, for where the information is, because it comes from many different sources. Food obviously is, is one exposure pathway, but as we see in products, when we're, we're looking at carpet, um, you know, dust, air, dermal, all of these things are factors and we don't have all the information. So I guess what the long-winded answer is, we just need to keep doing more of what we're doing. We need to coordinate and we need to be strategic as best we can to go to those kind of critical path areas that will help us all uh, meet our mandates. It's a lot of work. I think that's a really good question. And Carl, I really appreciate your answer as well. I mean, I think you've sort of summarize why biomonitoring is so hard for us to figure out our priorities because all of these things are so important. I mean, do we want to look at legacies or the new ones? Is it more important to figure out the percentage of um, exposure source for, for you know, is it, is it the broad exposures or every little exposure? Are the highly exposed individuals or is the general population more important? And then is it, you know, how do we get this information? How do we actually make impact? How do we work with our partners to message out how people can be um, healthier and make more safe choices. So all of these things are important and you would need a much bigger program to, to address all these things. So that is why we often have these questions like, how do we make the biggest impact? What, which one of these um, parameters would be, would be key for us to follow through? And, and, and I think it's great that we've had a much more um, robust interagency collaboration on PFAS. I think it's one of the things that really speeds our work on PFAS and helps us kind of address all of those things. But it is a giant machine for us to be um, addressing with a very small program. Um, so I appreciate the difficulty of it. Sarah, you have something to answer. And then I just wanna say, it sounds like Kathleen has something to add to this question and then we'll move on to Ulrika's question and I see Carl next. I just had a quick logistics matter, just for the benefit of the transcriber, particularly if your camera is not showing, make sure to identify yourself. So that was Narissa, which I'm sure <laughs> Jim will figure out. But um, for those of you who are visible, it's pretty easy for him to figure out who's speaking, but make sure you identify yourself again uh, when you speak. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, and apologies, my video does not seem to be working. So I will try to speak clearly, uh, Kathleen Atfield. Uh, I also wanted to point Tom um, this, you know, this is the huge question and uh, point Tom to uh, our later speakers who are gonna help us with thinking about uh, other ways that we are looking into um, being able to understand exposure sources. So we do have, of course, biomonitoring is cumulative across many different types of exposure sources. And we have questionnaires, but you know that is only going to inform us so far. We do not have um, so far information on people's general dust levels or of course uh, drinking water. And of course PFAS uh, have bioaccumulated in our bodies for such a long time. So uh, questionnaires definitely have their limitations. 
as far as being able to reveal historic sources. But more conversation on that from the presentator, presentations coming after us. Thank you, Ulrika. Yeah, I wanted to also thank the, to the presenters for those really interesting and thought provoking presentations. Um, my questions, I think, though, um, are uh, maybe more for Kathleen, um, and they relate to this, these um, associations of the, the racial disparities um, and, and association with seafood consumption as regards some of these PFAS um, results. And so one question I had was whether, um, so you looked at mercury and you saw that with um, blood mercury, there was also that that seemed to me, you know, that also was associated, had the same kind of um, uh, racial ethnic disparities. And I was wondering if you did speciation of arsenic, which is also very strongly associated with uh, the organic forms of arsenic with seafood consumption, and whether you saw similar results with that, if, if those, the speciation was also done, because that would help to I think maybe support that association even more. And then another question I had was whether you had information about the specific types of seafood they were eating. And I think with these long lived PFAS, you would expect that the, you know, the predatory species higher up in, in the food web would have a stronger association. So those were my two questions, thanks. Thank you, Ulrika. Uh, for arsenic, we do speciate when they hit a certain threshold. Um, and um, so we don't have uh, that information across the entire uh, care study, um, but that does mean, yes, then we can look a little bit more in those folks that have been speciated. Um, and your other uh, question was about the specific types of fish that are consumed. So no, for care, we don't have uh, that granularity of information. And those types of questions are about the general consumption pattern, so not tied to a particular time period. However, in the ACE studies, we've got quite detailed questions about the types of uh, fish and shellfish that people have been consuming, uh, not only kind of general and over the past year, but in the last 30 days. So it, the different time periods can tell you different things and tie differently to uh, the analytes of interest. Thank you. I had the same question about the uh, species of fish thinking, does it travel the same way mercury does? And can you give advisories about consumption in that same way, just because it's a they're persistent and bioaccumulative compounds. Thanks. Um, I think Carl is next up with a question. And um, it could be tricky to remember to put your hand down on the Zoom interface. So if um, you can do that when you're done, that will help us. Uh, thank you. Um, I thought those were terrific uh, presentations. One of them caught my eye. There's always a shortage of funds for dealing with these problems. I did notice that there one of the items I believe Carl uh, highlighted was the possibility of compensation for uh, spreading um, PFAS and their varieties all over California and in the food and so forth. Minnesota had a very successful uh, suit against uh, 3M, I believe, and um, uh, DuPont. And I'm wondering if there has been thought given to that because um, they, they had a, in Minnesota, they have a huge cleanup problem. They also have huge cleanup problems in West Virginia and Northern and Southern Ohio. Um, and I don't know how, how, how detailed their health effects had to be, but uh, that was part of it. And I have a legal document that was used in the Minnesota case as evidence. Can I just make a quick comment to Carl's point? Um, so one of the things that US EPA is proposing in their roadmap is to um, list uh, PFAS as a CERCLA hazardous substance, which would then bring it into the domain of the cleanup authorities that many states have, and they have at the federal level, and the liabilities and responsibilities that come with that. Similarly, under the Resource Conservation Act, Re Recovery Act, EPA has been petitioned to add PFAS containing waste as RICRA hazardous waste. So many of us, whether it's in hazardous waste or in water, you know, you have the certain authorities only if you're captured in the regulatory framework. And I think the other thing is that's relevant is that um, what we're talking about is moving upstream, hopefully. 
which is rather than waiting till we see it in people and the environment, what can we do to encourage using safer alternatives? And that's difficult as well because we don't have the authorities and we also don't have the knowledge of where all these chemicals are used in the supply chains. Um, and, and so we see it in the environment, we see it in fish, we can measure it in people. Uh, we need to do better to coordinate on that, but we also need to move upstream to find out why these chemicals are actually being used and if there are safer alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's, Jose, did you have a question? We're just about out of time for panel questions, but then we'll come back after a moment of comment to panel discussion. So if it's a I longer point. Great, okay, we'll hold it till then. So um, I think we have uh, 10 minutes for public comment here. And I wanna um, start that by just reading um, a question that was put into the Zoom chat from Silent Spring Institute. And Sarah, you can tell us if we need a name or if that's sufficient identification. Um, um, I'll just, this is Sarah answering Meg. Um, sure, if they're willing to identify themselves, that would be great for the transcript. They're not required to, but okay. yeah. So the question is, are the care participants provided with their individual results and translational resources to understand their significance? My understanding is yes, under the um, statutory requirements, but I'll let someone in the program explain more. Um, the answer is yes, as you have said. Um, in accordance with our legislation, all participants with um, a biomonitoring studies, are, um, their results are made available to them. And about 98% of our participants do elect to receive the results. And so production of these packets, which include not only their results, but comparison to NHANES and study statistics, but also potential expo exposure sources and associations with health impacts. Are, are provided to participants of all of our studies. The one exception that Kathleen alluded to is the MAMA studies for which we don't have the identification of, of participants. It's an anonymous sample for which we only have some demographic guidance. Great. Uh, we have a comment here from Nancy Biermeyer of uh, BCPP, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. Thank you to the SGP Biomonitoring California. That is, I'm just gonna read the comment. Um, Thank you to the SGP Biomonitoring California and the Safer Consumer Products Program for your work and specifically for considering and prioritizing PFAS as a class. Not only did it support passage of the food packaging, juvenile products and firefighting foam PFAS ban bills, the class approach has also allowed us to require disclosure of all PFAS in various consumer product sectors, including cleaning products, fragrance and flavors in personal care and cosmetic products, feminine products, and most recently cookware. Um, so let me check in with staff about whether there are any um, comments on the um, email, submitted by email. Uh, there are not. And um, I can't see participant requests to speak. Can you, Cheryl? I... Hi, this is Shoba Iyer. Um, I'm monitoring for any raised hands amongst uh, attendees, and I am not seeing any at the moment. Great. I have um, another short comment in the question and answer section from Cheryl Patton. Um, two pesticides containing PFAS are registered for use in California. They are uh, hexaflumoron and novaluron. to add on to the discussion of pesticides that showed up earlier. Um, I wanna leave just another moment for public comment since we are not out of time for that yet. And it could take a minute to navigate the interface and get a question posted or um, raise a hand and have it spotted. So as long as Shoba and Cheryl don't see, oh, Sarah, did you wanna? I, I'm, just, I'm just respecting the pause, but when you're done with your pause, I wanted to chime in on one of the questions that was raised. So whenever that's appropriate. Maybe I'll just check with Cheryl and Shoba that there's no additional no. requests for comment. 
um, or submissions online to the email. And then Sarah, please go ahead. Okay, for those of you who've been around for a long time, this will uh, be of no surprise, but not everyone is aware of OEHA's very early and foundational work on developing chemical groups and classes for identifying for biomonitoring. So that's an approach that Gail and I came up with very early in the program. We started with flame retardants and we extended it. And that has been the standard approach that we've used for chemical selection, including for PFASs. Uh, so Gina Solomon, who is a former SGP member, actually encouraged us to write it up in a paper, which we did, and it was published in EHP. So I'm going to drop that into the Q&A, and we'll link to it um, on the meeting page as well. Great. And um, I want to second that just from somebody who uh, wasn't involved about how influential I've seen that be, um, the fact that biomonitoring uh, program scientists really um, went through the tremendous amount of work that it requires to designate and defend a class and how then that ripples through in the way that Carl Palmer described how other um, groups both within and outside of government can pick that up um, and use it in other purposes. So I think it really has been a, a tremendous contribution that the program has made. Um, and then I was very happy to see it published and appreciate that and I've, I've given it to students and <laughs> Um, appreciate it being in the, uh, in the literature. So we have time now for um, a panel discussion. We have 15 minutes. Actually, we're like five minutes out of time, so we're okay. Um, and I wanted to start with Jose, who didn't get his question asked earlier. Um, uh, thank you, and thank you very much for the presentations. Um, uh, one general question, so right now, are the data made available, say, for interested researchers in analyzing some of the care study data and obtaining information of variables available? Um, in, in particular, addressing this questions that would be pertinent to exposure sources of PFAS. I'm sure that the questionnaires have captured a lot of information, and it might be, you know, in, interesting to have multiple people starting to understand what are the main sources of these exposures, or at least exposures that are associated with P greater PFAS concentrations within these uh, California groups. Kathleen, are you answering this question? I can also take it. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so what is available readily online is our distribution data, but we do have the policy of wanting to work with outside researchers. So there's a application process, I think, detailed on our website. Uh, I was going to uh, give a little more information about what kind of questionnaire data is available for care. Uh, so there is, as I said, some information related to general dietary um, uh, habits, as well as uh, occupation, uh, drinking water source, uh, some some uh, consumer product use, such as uh, water resistant sprays or um, water and stain resistant clothing and furniture. So the, the, there's a good number uh, of items that uh, it covers. Um, and of course, for women, we have information on pregnancy um, because that is, of course, uh, correlated. We do not have um, weight and height, which is a, a limitation of the data. Um, I think that covers most things. And just as a follow-up, so I'm, I'm actually on the website. Is it easily available to obtain that information from the website? Is that something you want to have available? I'm sorry, are you asking the types of uh, questionnaire data that are available? Yeah, for that matter, I mean, what is available um, for, for a researcher to be able to ask you a more direct question about maybe you want to get these variables and look at these associations. Um, is that on the website? I'm, I'm just having it spent too much time with it. Uh, Jose, no, it is not currently on the website and I will punt that to Nerissa as far as that has definitely uh, been something we have wanted to do. So what is on the website are our questionnaires. I believe both the ACE and maybe the CARE questionnaire are available, which would give somebody um, starting to think about this, an idea of the kinds of questions we ask. Of course, the next step is to talk to us about, you know, how did a question work? Was there 
homogeneity or heterogeneity in answers is a question that we're really going to be able to do analyses with. But I think as um, Kathleen has described in her talk, there are lots of opportunities for research and it's beyond what we as a program can do. And one of our, one of our um, big challenges is to get to all of this analysis. We ask all these questions, we have piles of data. And for those of you in academia who may have, um, have students looking for projects to work on things, we are very happy to, to work alongside your students. Yeah, I mean, and just the, the final the final piece, and this is can be a little more complicated, but could have very uh, profound. It's a it could be a profound way to uh, to also involve people from the community. Is uh, and in some sites, uh, if somebody wants to just log in there and just click 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 away, as you know, what are the exposure concentrations in certain groups? Um, sometimes some sites have ways in which you can click and look at that, and then you get some summary output statistics. Mm -hmm. Of course, that involves some investment from the other side, right, from the website uh, generation things. But it could be something to start getting the community a little more, more engaged so they can look at these things. Um, any comment in that regard, the feasibility of doing something like that, or maybe you're doing something like that already? I think our web platform is not as sophisticated as, as some private organizations. And so I think there are limits to what we might be able to post on our website. Um, one of the reasons we are putting out the care report is so that that data will be available and it's not in a clickable, easily accessible format, but it will get into more detail about you know, different cells um, within, our, within our study population. Um, we'll get much more into exposure questions that were considered and why or why not they were, we followed them. Um, with additional analyses. So the report is kind of our step in that direction to make more transparent and more available the kinds of information we've done. I mean, it's, it's a learning process for us. If a question doesn't work, you know, why or why not? And that informs our next questionnaire. But we also want to have that kind of information available for other researchers who might be thinking of asking a similar question. So I think your, your question, your, um, your proposal is a good one. I think it, it's, um, IT work is very is fairly difficult for us to um, to accomplish in the program, but the report is one way we'll we'll try to accomplish those goals. Thank you. So maybe just to flag for the moment that um, because Kathleen was specifically sort of requesting for. Um, collaboration <laughs> and essentially um, help. Uh, um, analyzing some of the data that are available and Jose is asking about accessibility of the same information. It sounds like some of it may not be, you know, um, you can't passively access it, but there's an open invitation to engage with the program and um, do more analysis of the data. Um, so I just wanted to flag that because I think that's what I took from that part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it would be nice to make it maybe perhaps a little more explicit um, just by looking at the website, I have to get, so the options are to learn more about the study and then it talks about care study in LA County and frequently asked questions. But it might be good to have a, a section saying, well, for if you want to find out more how to get data out of what it is that you need to do or what data is available, first of all. So uh, a researcher can first see what's available and then have a more direct question to you so you don't have to start explaining the same thing over and over as to what data is available and things like those. Great, Vina. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to all the presenters for really in, informative um, slides. And I um, wanted to really ex express my appreciation to um, Vince and others who, um, for their kind words on my service uh, uh, on the panel. And, you know, I'll say, this is definitely not the last of me in these meetings. I'm sure I will be back. So um, it's not, not goodbye just until next time. And I had a comment and, um, and a question related to the discussion of sort of, the priorities around PFAS biomonitoring for the program, because um, as usual, there's 
no shortage of work to be done here and um, and many, many different avenues and, and angles that um, are worthy of exploration. So, you know, my, I did want to second a comment that Carl had made around um, gathering data and evidence relevant to understanding if um, policies are effective. So we heard about a lot of great legislation and work at the agency um, on kind of different sources and products. So, um, you know, drinking water, food packaging, food service, where juvenile products. So, um, you know, I think to the extent that um, data and study designs can really help speak to um, how, how the those policies as they're being implemented um, are effective and changing or, or affecting um, PFAS exposures would be extremely valuable. And then um, my other, other question on kind of the priorities piece is the sort of ability to um, kind of get input from communities or partners as to their priorities moving forward. Because I know the program has um, really good relationships with um, some of the groups they've partnered with, like for the ACE study and other studies. So I think that could also be a really um, a good discussion to in, inform priorities um, moving forward to kind of reflect what is most important to communities and what they, they want to know. Thank you, Bina. Um, I, I kind of want to echo something that you just said, it was sort of with illustration from my own work. I think this has come up in past, our past discussions too, and I think maybe we have echoed each other's um, points on this, but as, as people who um, I think both of us work with sort of finding evidence for and against various policy interventions, um, and that, um, in my work on it, um, what has proved the most challenging is finding data from which you, that you can use to establish time trends. And I think we all understand why that's hard. You know, you were, you have to come back and measure either the same or comparable populations with the same or comparable methods um, for the same chemicals um, over time. And so to manage to have done that for um, a lot of different chemicals over a long period of time probably requires um, a, a level of resources that has never been put into biomonitoring, essentially, um, um, you know, somewhat, of course, through NHANES um, uh, at the federal level. But um, just, to, just to kind of echo what Vina said about when we're looking at the impact of policies, what we really need is to be able to suss out time trends because um, there was one level of exposure, there were things that happened in the interim, and then we want to know what is happening to the other exposure levels. And, and just acknowledging how, what a big ask that is um, of, of a research study um, to create that, that data, um, but that that is kind of the holy grail in terms of being able to see what's happening over time and make some guesses about which interventions have had the greatest effect. So just to sort of echo that point and how hard it has been, how hard it has been to find data um, on that. Jenny. Well, you just said very eloquently, one of my points about time trends, the importance for policy and seeing that public health policies work but the other point I wanted to add on top of that was uh, and to getting back to your original question about what should be our priority priorities for biomonitoring in California. I think that also monitoring disparities and changes in disparities over time is important. I think we saw that a little bit with the flame retardants that exposures changed and then they changed over time with you know, increasing or, or continuing exposures in certain populations and reductions in others. Um, so I just wanted to add that as, as a priority, I think, for the program. Great. Tom. So uh, this is sort of a comment and a question, and it, it follows the trend. I mean, this is one of the hard things to do when you're just looking at 
tissue levels or biomonitored levels is to really understand what's going on. And I think, I mean, we brought this up many times about multiple pathways. So in, in making this comment, I have to, you know, first reveal my uh, conflict or bias or whatever. Um, Matt McLeod was a postdoc with me about 20 years ago for two years. So I'm, and I've collaborated with him a lot. But I raised that, so I was impressed to see that you're working with his group at Stockholm. I mean, there are other groups who are as good and but I think they're outstanding. And the, the reason they're useful for trying to understand piece this together is the map is a modeler who sees models not for prediction but for understanding and, and I think that's what we need in this and that's why I'm biased because I think that way too I don't I don't think models are tools that you go out and say this is what you know we're going to predict what happens we're just trying to see if they're you know if we can begin to connect more dots and put things together and so my question is, I hope that there's some continuing collaboration either with Matt McLeod or other people who do that kind of cumulative exposure, multiple pathway exposure linked to pharmacokinetics to try and see if we can make sense of what's happening in the relationship. Ah, well, uh, this is Kathleen Atfield. I'll respond to that in that we're just in the beginning stages of that collaboration. So okay. it, will, it will be continuing. And it, it's, it actually had started a couple of years ago, but he uh, he had a delay. So the upside of that being that now we have CARE2 data that he can work with as well. Any other responses or thoughts from the panel based on the morning's presentations so far? Ulrika. This is sort of a minor and, and specific question, but something that I found intriguing um, in, I think it was in Carl's presentation uh, related to the chrome plater, uh, platers as a source of exposure to PFAS. And I noticed on the map that the location of the chrome platers was only suspected. <laughs> I was wondering if um, you could say more about that, because obviously knowing where these exposures are coming from is really important. And if there's not information about where chrome plating is happening, that's a potentially important source of information that there may be a lack, you know, may be lacking actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I'm, I'm not sure the, the air board's specificity on that. I do know, having worked with chrome platers for many years, is that um, we know where, I know the air board knows where most of them are. Part of the big question is what are they using? Um, because um, there's a variety of different baths <clears throat> that they use in processes and they purchase um, these, these chemicals based on a spec and a function, not on content. And so oftentimes the platers don't, themselves don't know what are in those chemicals. And even some of the companies that provide them may not know depending on their supply chain. So um, it's complicated, but I, th I think Airboard does know where all the, all the chrome platers are, but I think the bigger issue is the chrome platers may themselves not know what's in the materials that they use. Thank you. That that is that's a huge issue for sure. Yeah, I was just going to say like another illustration of the problem that has plagued um, the use of chemicals in products and materials um, since they were invented, at least in our system of governance. Um, we're just about to move on to our next presentation, but I just want to check for any final comments. Yes, please, Jose. Um, just one, one final, um, um, just more of a methods comment. Um, given the vast distribution of PFAS, um, how much thought or concern was there or what are the, what are the methods in, to, during the sample collection, sample storage during aliquoting and things like those to reduce some of the PFAS exposures that may be coming, say, from cryobiles? Um, uh, or other uh, storage media which you have? Well, our lab, um, I think Jun Su is on, could address that better than I, but we do run blanks for everything, field and 
and lab blanks. Um, Jin Su, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for uh, the question. Not only the uh, carrying the uh, 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 to carry, uh, collect the field blank, but also the it was a while ago uh, before we uh, decided to use uh, the test to collect the blood. Uh, we tested uh, them. Uh, we purchased and tested them for PPS background. And we are confirmed it's a, uh, the, it has a background free for PPS compound. Then we decide to purchase bulk and send them out for the uh, field collection. That's what happened. So not only covered by uh, method blank, field blank, but also we already tested it out, uh, uh, tested thoroughly before we uh, choose that brand. That's what we always do for biomonitoring program. Hope I answered to your question, Jose. Yeah, yeah, and uh, just out of curiosity, so you found, did, did you find a wide range of PFAS concentrations just in the like vacutainer tubes, or I mean, I'm not picking on the brand, but uh, on the blood collection tubes? No, we didn't, yeah, we didn't. We, we tested, uh, uh, I believe, uh, a couple of a, a brand, uh, so but uh, we didn't. Also, we uh, stopped using the red top uh, tube. Uh, we to in order to uh, more uh, uh, in, uh, the uh, the easier implement. Uh, you know, the, for field field uh, the step, uh, we choose uh, uh, using uh, the serum separation tube. But we didn't find the uh, uh, much background uh, uh, for the uh, test tube with that brand uh, we tested. Yeah. And and then um, was this measured in plasma or in serum for PFAS? And uh, then the next question is: Were there samples ever stored in other cryovials? And did you get a chance to look at PFAS in some of those uh, cryo tubes, for instance? Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. I, hey, Nick, I, just, I just wanted to suggest that you hold this for the later discussion because we really do need to move on to stay to stay on our scheduled time slot and we have a whole hour later to talk about these issues. Jose, will you just make a note so you don't forget? Wonderful. We'll okay, thank you. thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you to the um, staff who uh, updated us this morning, we're gonna move on and I want to introduce Anna Karman. She's deputy head of the School of Science and Technology and associate professor of environmental chemistry at Obrero University in Sweden. Her main research agenda is to unravel the drivers of toxicity by seeking relevant and sensitive methods, including applying non-targeted methodologies to identify and quantify organic pollutants. She focuses on analytical chemistry and emerging organic pollutants, their distribution in the environment, sources, and human exposure. Anna has conducted studies on per and per polyfluoroalkyl substances, microplastics, and other contaminants of concern. And here she'll be discussing novel approaches for expanding the range of PFAS analyses. Thank you very much, Meg, for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Well, good morning and uh, good evening, I could say at the same time. I'm going to share my slides here. Uh, so I'm uh, currently in, in Sweden, uh, at, um, uh, in Örebro, and I will uh, talk to you about uh, measuring PFAS. Let's see if I can get it in the right mode. That's Is this good. The okay, Perfect. excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about um, measuring PFAS. And I would like to start with a short disclosure that I have no um, uh, conflict of interest to disclose. Um, so I would like to take the opportunity to focus on the analysis of PFAS as a whole group and uh, present to you some of the possibilities and challenges that uh, I have identified the last couple of years trying to pursue this um, um, measuring method. 
Uh, and more specifically, I would like to uh, present some of the experiences using combustion ion chromatography analysis. Uh, so uh, I will present a few studies on environmental and human matrices uh, using this uh, CIC method and uh, compare it to target PFAS screening. Um, and also uh, we have done a little bit of quality control using this method. And finally, I will present some of the conclusions from my work. So in the sake of discussing PFAS as a group, I would like to uh, focus on fluorine in my introduction. Uh, so the most common form of fluorine found in nature is fluoride. So here it exists uh, as different mineral salts in, in quite high abundances in some um, environmental compartments. Uh, there are only a few examples of natural occurring organofluorine. Uh, so one example is the molecule that you can see in this picture, and it's uh, fluoroacetate, which is being produced by some plants uh, as a protection against grazing. Uh, there are also a few known examples of um, natural occurring organofluorine compounds from volcano activities. But the large proportion of organofluorine that we might find in nature is uh, anthropogenic organofluorine, uh, such as uh, PFOS. And uh, this belong, these compounds then belong to per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that represent the class uh, of substances, uh, depending on the definition, but I have chosen to use the latest OECD definition saying that they should contain at least one per fluorocarbon moiety. So of course, uh, it's important as uh, mentioned before today, uh, it's important to uh, acknowledge which kind of definition we are choosing. Uh, so this has, been the, this has been under discussion for many years, uh, uh, how to define this uh, class. Uh, so narrowing it down a little bit, uh, when it comes to monitoring, uh, it tends to be around three different groups of PFASs. So the first group is perfluoroalkyl acid. Uh, they are the perfluorinated acids, for example, the sulfonic acids or the carboxylic acids. We have a large group of precursor compounds that are uh, semi-persistent and can be further transformed to the uh, perfluoroalkyl acids. And we have a group that contains uh, different kinds of fluoropolymers. And uh, when it comes to uh, usage in products and production volumes, it's the two classes to the right that are the most important. So they are being produced in the highest volumes and they are being used in products uh, the most or even or more than the perfluoroalkyl acids. So the motivation behind monitoring PFAS is obviously that we want to be able to study uh, these different classes, how they affect the environment and how they affect us humans. Uh, so the latest news from, from Europe, you might say, is that the European Union decided earlier this year to revise the drinking water directive and include a group approach for PFAS total, uh, meaning that the totality of PFAS um, will have a threshold concentration of 0.5 microgram per liter in drinking water. So this new uh, threshold concentration is to be served as a complement to the limit that is based on 20 individual PFAS compounds. Uh, however, there is no method mentioned in the drinking water directive and 
this new group approach uh, should be implemented as soon as the required method becomes available. And this is quite um, good news for us scientists, I would say, that the European Union has adopted this group-based approach. And uh, the motivation of this is, of course, uh, the problem with uh, different replacement products showing up and also uh, about the regrettable substitution. So with this group approach, uh, we will have some more tools uh, for uh, PFAS control. And the basis of this group uh, approach is, is obviously the precautionary principle that allows decision makers to take measures even though the scientific evidence is not really showing exactly which compounds are um, uh, environmental or human hazards. But when there is really uh, high stakes, uh, um, there is no need to, to show the full uh, scale of evidence. So, for example, in Sweden, we have had this uh, precautionary principle when it comes to uh, pesticides for a long time. So if a substance is being used as the pesticide, uh, it, it cannot end up in the groundwater. Uh, even though there is no toxicity data, uh, there is a, a rule saying that uh, it should not end up in the groundwater regardless. So there's a limit value of all pesticides regardless their structure and properties. Um, so uh, for PFAS then, uh, if, we, if we want to look at the total PFAS, it comes quite uh, close to mind to look at fluorine as a like a marker for PFAS. And this picture, I will not go into so much details, but this picture uh, tries to illustrate uh, what we can do and how we can define uh, different types of fluorine. So if we start from the very top, uh, we have total fluorine, which we might be able to um, measure when we take food packaging material and we take some sort of fluorine detection and we measure directly on the packaging material, uh, we will get the total fluorine content. But we don't really know so much what the fluorine consists of. And the very opposite going down in this tree, we have the target organofluorine, which might be PFOS, uh, PFOA, or 20 or 40 different uh, target PFASs. Uh, total fluorine, of course, can consist of inorganic fluorine and organic fluorine. And we're not, very, we're not interested in the inorganic part, so we want to try to isolate the organic fluorine. And uh, doing that, uh, often it involves some sort of extraction to be able to um, take away the inorganic form. And doing this, we might adsorb the organofluorine on a carbon material. We might extract out it using different sor sorbents or different solvents. But there's also always a risk that there are organofluorines that we will not be able to extract out. And of course, going from the top to the bottom in this fluorine tree, uh, we gain increasing specificity of PFAS, uh, meaning that we will be more certain that we are actually looking at the uh, CF2 uh, uh, chemicals that we want to target. So uh, there are a number of different possibilities uh, to be able to uh, assess the total uh, PFAS. Uh, if we want to uh, directly measure PFAS total, that will be very, very challenging uh, to do. So in the literature today, uh, you can find uh, two other uh, assessments that are more commonly used. 
so we have the extractable or the adsorbable organofluorine that I mentioned before, which means that uh, a suitable extraction method is chosen for the sample matrix in question, uh, together with some fluorine specific detection or total fluorine, where we use direct measurement of fluorine uh, with some sort of detection that is specific for fluorine. Uh, and there's a number of methods that are being described. Uh, so a number of fluorine specific methods are available. Uh, the combustion ion chromatography, CIC, the particle induced gamma ray emission, the PG, spectroscopy, we have inductively coupled plasma spectrometry, ICPMS, and continuum source graphite furnace molecular absorption spectroscopy. So I will not go into any of these details. Um, and at the very bottom, quite interesting, interesting, we can find actually specific methods for perfluorinated substances. So that is exactly that I said was very challenging. So how can we be very specific on CF2 parts of a molecule? So we do have methods that can be specific, but uh, unfortunately, the detection limits are a bit too high to be uh, useful in, in uh, all applications. But in a few applications, there's definitely uh, good methods for perfluorinated substances. Uh, so what are the challenges? Um, so at the moment, I would say that one challenge is that uh, the high standardization requirements might uh, prevent data from coming out on uh, PFAS as a group. Uh, and, and this is data that it could be very useful at the moment to do uh, initial hazard assessment of the, the whole group of, of PFAS. Uh, another challenge is that there is a, a huge demand for low quantification levels. So at the same time as there is a requirement to measure PFAS as a group, at the same time there's also high demand for very, very low quantification levels of the uh, target PFAS. So, uh, one example is that the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, reduced the tolerable weekly intake uh, with three orders of magnitude uh, from only 2008 to 2020. So currently uh, there is a, a TWI of 4.4 nanogram per kilogram body weight per week for the sum of PFOS, PFOA, PFH excess and PFNA. And member state has reacted to this. Uh, so in Sweden, where I live, uh, we have not really revised any of our um, limit values yet, but uh, our neighbor Denmark uh, recently launched uh, a new limit value for the sum of the four PFAS in drinking water to 0.002 microgram per liter. So um, there's definitely a demand for very sensitive analytical methods. Uh, another uh, challenge is of course to obtain this PFAS total measurements and to remove the inorganic fluoride before using any fluorine specific uh, detection method, uh, which is uh, very important, especially for some matrices. Uh, another question that is heavily debated is if we really want to target all organofluorines. Uh, so for example, there are pesticides and pharmaceuticals that are uh, low fluorinated uh, compounds that might not be all too relevant when it comes to human health uh, or even uh, environmental health. Um, so in Europe at the moment, there's a large discussion about this trifluoroacetic acid, which is a, a transformation product from uh, many different chemicals. Uh, and it's occurring in very, very high concentrations in our natural waters. And this has the CF3 group 
uh, which it makes it uh, a PFAS compound. We also have some pesticides and pharmaceuticals that also contains the CF3 groups. And uh, I have one example here of an LCM28 substance, which is a liquid crystal monomer, uh, which is um, used in uh, flat screens, uh, uh, cell phones, uh, for example, tablets. So is this what we want to target in our PFAS total assessment uh, or not? And finally, uh, the, uh, even though we have the detection methods needed, uh, we do have a quite big challenge with the extraction method uh, to be able to capture a wide range of different PFAS compounds that constitute this PFAS total. So uh, probably there will be requirements for multiple extraction approaches to capture PFAS total. And uh, there was a discussion about uh, blank contamination before, and uh, I, I can mention that uh, it's like starting all over again when measuring PFAS total uh, when it comes to uh, checking all the lab equipment for any kind of fluorine containing um, substances. Uh, so I would like to continue now with uh, one of these techniques that I mentioned that could be used uh, for fluorine detection, and that is the combustion ion chromatography, CIC. So in this technique, uh, we uh, can introduce a sample that can be a solid or a liquid containing all different kinds of uh, organofluorines. And uh, we have a combustion oven that uh, we uh, have it working on 1050 uh, degrees Celsius to be able to break the uh, bond between carbon and fluorine. And uh, the combustion is done together with the water. So we have a hydropyrolysis forming uh, HF, which is captured in uh, water forming uh, fluoride, and we can measure it using a very conventional ion chromatography. Uh, so what we also do is that we take the same sample or extract, and we also measure the target PFAS in the same extract. And together with the fluorine concentration, we can do this fluorine mass balance. So we know uh, how much of the samples organofluorine do we know, uh, about from our target PFAS analysis and how much is unknown. Uh, so I would like to just go through a few of our studies. Uh, so this is uh, a study where we did a screening uh, uh, of uh, many different environmental matrices from the Nordic countries. Uh, so we extracted out organofluorine and also we targeted uh, 73 known uh, PFASs. So as you can see here, we have a number of different matrices that we analyzed. The blue bars are the percentage of the known PFAS, uh, and the gray bar is the percentage of the unknown organofluorine. And uh, here is the average target PFAS of, of the extractable organofluorine in percentage. And as you can see, uh, the lowest percentage of known PFAS was found in surface water, uh, wastewater treatment sludge, and also uh, effluent water. And the highest proportion of known PFAS was found in bird eggs. Uh, so this, show, this shows that we have quite a large proportion of, of unknowns. However, we have no information from this analysis on the identity of unknowns and also uh, measuring uh, fluorine with CIC is less sensitive than measuring the target PFAS. So we have uh, quite a big difference between detection limits for these two methods. Uh, so uh, the next step is, of course, to try to find out what are the missing 
uh, fraction, what is the unknown fraction. And uh, for this uh, one method that is frequently used by other labs as well, uh, and, and also including us, is to, to do the suspect screening to identify unknowns. Uh, so we use a database uh, provided by the Norman network, uh, constituting of 3,236 uh, individual PFAS. And uh, here are the same matrices, and we have uh, a positive uh, hit on the red and the uh, pink uh, cells in this figure. So there's, do, there's two different identification levels uh, for the red and the pink. Uh, matches. Uh, and by comparing uh, different matrices like this, we can uh, conclude or we can see that there seems to be like more uh, low molecular weight PFASs in the water and the effluent and moving up to marine mammals and to bird eggs we have a higher molecular weight PFASs. However, we don't have that great confidence in the identification because we don't have any standards for these compounds. Uh, we have also seen that we have some transformation products um, uh, or at least probable transformation products. So there could be a biotic transformation going on and we will actually be able to extract out the transformation products. Um, uh, another thing is that uh, uh, one question that arises is whether the uh, uh, analytical method will be able to ionize uh, all uh, PFASs that uh, our uh, CAC instrument uh, managed to analyze the fluoride from. So uh, comparing these two uh, instruments uh, in the fluorine mass balance can be a little bit difficult because the detection techniques are so different. So there's definitely some challenges here. Uh, this is a study of uh, human blood samples from uh, Sweden doing the same sort of fluorine mass balance. Uh, so this is a Swedish uh, whole blood from uh, males and females of different age groups. And uh, uh, you can see in this figure the, uh, um, the unexplained organofluorine or the unidentified organofluorine as the black portion of the bars. Uh, and after that we have PFOA, PFHXS, we have branched PFOS, linear PFOS. And then we have a white portion of the bar, which is uh, the sum of 60 other uh, different target PFAS. So what was quite interesting in this study is that uh, looking at the fluorine, organofluorine content of the blood, uh, females had higher levels than males. Um, looking at the target PFAS levels, that usually is the opposite. Uh, so we did find large variations in groups and between groups, but despite that, we could see a significant difference between men and women, but also between some of the age uh, groups. So this is a study that came out from our group this year from our former PhD student, uh, Rudolf Aro. Uh, so one can also question whether if uh, we have uh, enough uh, reliability in the method. And uh, this is a study that we also uh, published this year looking at uh, groundwater, effluent and sludge. And uh, we could see that uh, between three laboratories we had quite a good um, uh, coherence uh, using this CAC method. Uh, uh, so uh, we could also demonstrate that the methods were specific for organofluorine and that it looked to be quite promising uh, to be used as the uh, drinking water directives method for PFAS total in drinking water. Uh, so my final Let's see, I will skip this. So my final slide here is that uh, 
uh, uh, we do have methods for assessing PFAS as a group. Uh, they are available. And uh, what we need to be looking at more closely, my opinion, is the extraction methods, which are the key aspect of the PFAS total assessment. Uh, probably there's no uh, single analytical approach that will fulfill the policy goals. Um, and using the extractable organofluorine uh, CIC method shows that we do have a large fraction of unknown organofluorine uh, in environmental and human samples uh, that is probably needed to look into into more detail. Uh, so I have a slide with references at the very end and also would like to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Anna. It was wonderful to hear. We have um, until 12.25 for um, questions from both the panel and um, the audience. And I will um, uh, just check in with staff to see if there's um, uh, questions from the audience as we go through. Um, I have a question in the chat that um, asking whether the slides will be made available. And I believe everything's posted on the uh, Biomonitoring California website, the, the page for today's meeting. Maybe yes. this is Sarah, yes, I can confirm. Oh, sorry, Cheryl. I just said <laughs> chimed in over you. Yes, everything's posted. Yep. Um, so, and I also just want to note that because, because Anna is joining us from Sweden, um, she will not be with us for the afternoon discussion session, which is not afternoon her time. Um, and so we have this 20 minute session now for um, discussion and questions um, for her talk because she won't be available this afternoon. So now is your chance. I have um, a question in the chat here from um, Simona Bolan of DTSC. Do your conclusions or recommendations on testing change in any way when, with regards to detecting PFAS in consumer products as opposed to in drinking water? Uh, yes, thank you, Simona, for that question. Um, so I do think it's a little bit different. Um, when considering consumer products uh, versus drinking water, uh, because I, I believe that in consumer products, we might not have the same problem with extracting out the, the relevant organofluorine. Uh, so my experience with uh, consumer products is that uh, it seems to be uh, quite okay to analyze them directly without actually uh, even concentrate or extract out um, the organofluorine. Uh, as opposed to drinking water where we do have the need to both concentrate the organofluorines and remove the inorganic fluoride in the water. Thank you. Um, Oliver, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, so, um, as, uh, thank you, it was very enlightening. Um, now, not everyone of us has these methods and these methods, as you say, are never perfect and they need to be combined and more extractions, um, which makes it harder for people to implement. If you would compare methods, um, can you also look for, in an untargeted manner, using the mass defect of fluorine in uh, very high resolution mass specs like orbitraps? And how would you rate those in comparison to the methods you have just shown to us. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Oliver. It's a very, very interesting question because this is something that we uh, are doing at the moment, uh, comparing different methods and trying to figure out where we can get the most relevant information. And uh, in addition to the ones that you suggested, I might also want to mention the, um, uh, the top essay uh, method uh, coming, that came out from Berkeley University. Uh, that is also something that we are using quite frequently. I would say that uh, with the CIC method, 
we will get a very comprehensive screening uh, directing our interest to samples of interest. It might be human samples from cohorts that have been contaminated through the drinking water. Uh, we can easily detect that with the, our CAC. Uh, without knowing which PFAS uh, they was they uh, uh, were uh, exposed to from the drinking water, uh, but of course knowing which PFAS and where it comes from, you kind of need more information than just a fluorine signal. Um, so. Uh, my experience using high resolution MS is that um, it's, it's quite good to be able to sort out uh, which classes uh, we have, which chain length we have, but to be able to distinguish immediately uh, a contaminated cohort versus an un a normal or, or a background contaminated cohort, it's not that easy. Um, so I think um, using mass defect plots, uh, uh, you will be able to uh, detect uh, new PFASs, but you, you, you might not immediately see the whole proportion of the, uh, the problem, so to speak. A follow-up question. If, if not by mass spectrometry, you could use ionability. Aaron Baker from North Carolina University has shown that fluorinated compounds, including PFAS, have a very clear and exactly what you say, a, a, a typical pattern that separates out all the fluorinated compounds from non-fluorinated compounds. Um, she's done it in pine needles uh, that, uh, over decades that uh, you know, um, were sampled in botanical reserve, reserves. And so she could see how the PFAS in different locations, uh, cr uh, for example, close to airports and so on, were, um, you know, sampled, uh, even historical samples. So, so and she did it with eye mobility. Have you considered that as well? Uh, we, we don't have an eye mobility MS in our lab, but I have used one uh, in other labs. Uh, we also had a cooperation with a group in Japan that uses that quite a lot. Uh, I think definitely it's a, it's a good, good instrument, a good uh, way to go to, as you can, as you say, uh, compare different samples from different regions to detect whether there is an exposure somewhere that is new or different from another group. Um, so I, I, I do do think it's quite good, but. Uh, honestly, in, in having a lab where I have the possibility to, to go both to the orbit trap and to the CIC, I mean, I always go to the CIC first <laughs> um, because it's, it's very easy. Uh, it's, um, um, it's uh, fast and you get uh, a very clear uh, quantitative result. Uh, but uh, having the CIC alone might not uh, help, uh, might not um, uh, be able to, I, I might not be able to uh, give you the, the research question uh, directly, uh, only having this instrument. So of course, if I had to choose, I have to choose between my mass spec lab and my CIC lab. I couldn't keep both. Of course, I would keep my mass spec lab. <laughs> Thank you. We have, um, uh, I think you, you might have just answered this, but I just want to say um, in the, the Q&A on Zoom, we have um, a question that says, did you investigate Kendrick Plot's mass defect CF2 for identifying fluorinated unknown compounds? Uh, yes, uh, uh, we have done that. Uh, also, I would say that the uh, CF2, uh, from my experience, is not the best um, um, mass defect plot to, to make to be able to detect fluorine containing compounds. But uh, often it's quite good to include uh, some uh, oxygen containing um, uh, fragments as well. But yes, uh, we, we have we have done that in, in our process of the uh, uh, non-target screening, even though we use, usually uh, use uh, suspect screening nowadays because of the good libraries that are available. 
And another question um, in the Q and A is, have you looked into the use of XRF and LIBS laser induced breakdown spectroscopy for total fluorine testing? And if so, how do they compare with CIC and PIGE? Yeah, no, I'm, unfortunately, I, I don't have any comparison with those two methods, uh, how they compare with the CIC. I've been involved in some studies comparing the CIC and the PG, uh, and I, 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 I'm suspecting that Simona knows about those already. Uh, but for the XRF and the, uh, the LIBS, I, I don't uh, have any experience of those, no. Thank you. We have just um, five or seven minutes remaining. Um, and I want to check in with staff if there are any questions from the audience or attendees uh, that we're not seeing in the Q&A that you're getting by email or with a raised hand. There, um, there are not, no. Okay, great. And no and raised hands either. Thank you, Shoba and Cheryl. Um, Ulrika, please. Yeah, hi. Thank you, um, Anna, for that very interesting presentation. Um, I was curious about the, you know, I think one of the last things that you said where you were talking about how females having greater organofluorine total than males, but then the men have higher levels of the targeted PFAS, whether you have any information about what specific um, PFAS are driving that higher level in the females. Uh, no, that's a very uh, good question, and that is something that uh, uh, we want to look into uh, in more depth, and uh, uh, partly also in collaboration with Tom Webster, that's going to present later today. Uh, so there's, of course, different speculations and hypotheses why uh, women would have a higher organofluorine level in their blood. Um, um, and um, some hypothesis involves uh, a higher exposure from personal care products. Um, other theories uh, concerns more um, pharmaceuticals uh, that uh, might be used more or less depending on the gender, but uh, there's just speculations at the moment. So, so this is an observation that that we made and uh, we need to look into it in, in more depth. Um, one, let's see, there's two questions. We have just five minutes, but hopefully I think these are relatively short um, from the Q&A. Sophia, uh, Schreckenbach asks, could you expand a bit on what mass defect plots you prefer to use for PFAS as opposed to CF2? Thank you. Oh, uh, so that uh, I think uh, will be very quick from my uh, point of view. I, 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 yeah, I think you shouldn't do anything opposed to CF2. So CF2 should also be included, but I think it's relevant to include other mass defects plots uh, containing fluorine as well. Uh, so there's a few in my uh, previous publications, but also in publications from Mark Streiner, for example, from the US EPA. So uh, I might just leave it by that. <laughs> and Eric Goudreau is asking, um, whether CIC is sensitive enough to detect organic extractable fluorine in human serum when you only have um, 100 microliters available. Mm. Yeah, so firstly, I would like to mention that uh, we have uh, we, we've seen uh, uh, quite a lot of PFASs in the red blood cells as well. So just looking at serum will uh, underestimate uh, the uh, internal uh, body, the internal exposure. Uh, and 100 microliter is also a quite small volume for the CIC. So unfortunately, the detection limits is uh, much higher compared to um, uh, normal LCMS analysis. Uh, so we use uh, at least 10 times higher than that at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Kathleen. 
Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And I was also very interested in the differences by gender that Ulrika brought up. I was wondering if you had more any historic uh, samples that you were able to do a comparison. Um, so my colleague Liu Yang uh, did a, a time trend analysis on, on German blood um, uh, some time ago. Uh, but uh, it, it's definitely um, something that we would like to continue with and look into more, uh, also the historical part of it. Um, um, we are also very interested in, we have, we have looked at the uh, populations exposed by drinking water, uh, the background population, but it also seems to be uh, quite different depending on geographical location in Sweden, which we are not very used to, to see when it comes to the target PFAS. So that is also something we would like to look into more in detail. Great. Anna, thank you so much for joining us um, and for your presentation. We will break for lunch now. Um, uh, it's scheduled to last an hour and um, we will restart right at 1.25. We're asking that everybody rejoin the webinar no later than 1.20 so that we can start the afternoon session on time. And before we adjourn, I'll um, just provide this informal Bagley Keen reminder that uh, for panel members, please comply as usual with Bagley Keen requirements and refrain from discussing, discussing panel business during lunch or during the afternoon break. And with that, I will adjourn the morning session of the meeting and we'll reconvene here at 1.20 to start again at 1.25. Thank you, everyone.